The Griswold Family Christmas Tree. Chevy Chase tries to survive a family get-together in National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. It's one of five new movies we'll review this week on Siskel and Ebert, and I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, and unlike the other two films in this series, this one isn't even remotely funny. It also lacks enterprise. It's the only film in the series where the Griswold family doesn't go anywhere. They stay stuck in their suburban Chicago home, some vacation. Chevy Chase and Beverly D'Angelo again play the Griswolds. I don't know, Sparky, I just have this feeling. Ellen, I want to have Christmas here in our house. It means a lot to me. All my life, I've wanted to have a big family Christmas. The joke here is that all sorts of weird relatives descend on the Griswold household, upsetting everything and everyone. After the in-laws show up, it's suddenly scuzzy cousin Randy Quaid and family. We were gonna call, but Eddie wanted to make it a surprise. Yeah, you surprised? <laughs> surprised, Eddie? <laughs> if I woke up tomorrow with my head sewn to the carpet, I wouldn't be more surprised than I am right now. The humor is mostly slapstick, bad slapstick, as, for example, when Chevy Chase is locked in his attic by his mother-in-law. Ooh. Oh. twice out of perhaps a hundred attempts at humor in this picture and one of them was when Chevy Chase lights up his house with Christmas lights. There are a lot of lights. In fact, it looks like the sun is in that neighborhood. But other than that, the humor is all of the nerdy in-law, nerdy neighbor variety. There's no comic energy in the story. The Griswolds can be funny when they go on vacation, but not here when they stay stuck at home. Well, I probably laughed more than twice and I would probably give it a better review than you would, but I can't recommend it. And it seemed to me that what we had here were all the elements and they just weren't quite firing. For example, when the in-laws turn up, they're not very funny, and they're not really differentiated, and they're not really made very interesting. They're just and, standard uh, joke in-laws, I mean. Yeah, yeah, in other words, nothing is really done with them. And uh, the whole business of how he gets trapped in the attic, you can see how that could lead to a whole series of physical gags, but really, they don't quite pay off. And over and over in the movie, I kept thinking, Gosh, it's here. If they just give it that extra push, maybe it's the director or... Well, I'll or, tell you, the director comes... Who the director couldn't quite get it over the it's top. It's a first-time director uh -huh. who comes from making TV commercials, and he doesn't make the transition very well. In addition, I thought... I mean, I really didn't like the film and felt disappointed in it because they can be funny on vacation. Why not take them on a trip again? Mm -hmm. It works twice. Why keep them stuck at home in one location? Uh, I thought of Cannonball Run 2, where they didn't have the energy or the, w uh, the wherewithal to take the people on a real cross-country trip. Yeah. Why not take these people on I'm a trip? I'm not sure that's why they didn't go on vacation here, but I wish the movie had gone a little bit more somewhere than where it went. Okay, next movie. And our next movie is one of the most talked about films of the last three months ever since it started getting standing ovations at film festivals in Colorado, Toronto, New York, and Chicago. Audiences go crazy for it, and now it's going as a national release. It's called Roger and Me, and all I can say is, if Woody Allen made documentaries, they might look a little bit like this one. The movie was directed right, by so Michael Moore, a muckraking journalist from Flint, Michigan, who got mad when General Motors laid off 30,000 workers there. The Roger in the title is Roger Smith, the chairman of General Motors, and the movie is the hilarious history of Moore's attempts to interview Smith about the problems in Flint. You don't have an appointment. You're not going up to Fort Smith. Well, can we go up and try and make an appointment? No. Why? I need Tony with me. Yeah, and the reason to talk to Roger Smith would be? Uh, Michael Moore. No, no. What's your reason for seeing Roger Smith? Excuse um, me. We're doing... I need to see you. We're making a film.
I quickly sized up the situation. Three guards in the booth, plus the one with a corsage. A dozen security cameras and four new cars with inflated sticker prices parked in the lobby. If I made a run for it up to Roger's office, what's the worst that could happen to me? As Flint sinks more deeply into poverty and unemployment, it makes an ill-advised attempt to turn itself into a tourist attraction. Jackie, what are some of the things that uh, visitors ask us here? That... First off, where is the bathroom? <laughs> That's the question I get asked most. Director Michael Moore is a born social satirist with an eye for the perfect detail. In this scene, the rich people in Flint throw a costume party while the poor people are hired as living sculptures for the party. So, what advice do you have for those who are having a rough go of it? Get up in the morning and go do something. Start yourself. Get your own motor going. There's things to do out there. One of the stars of the movie is Deputy Sheriff Fred Ross, the man in charge of evicting unemployed GM workers. You better get your clothes on, we here to put you out. I've put out some of my best to friends, but nothing personal, you know. And that deputy sheriff is not a bad guy. He's just doing his job. He says, I like to treat people the way I'd like to be treated myself. Roger and Me is the right movie in the right place and the right time and with the right sense of humor. I think a lot of people are fed up with corporations that think only of profits and use a smokescreen of public relations to make their selfish decisions look beneficial for everyone. This movie convincingly shows that the firings by General Motors have devastated Flint, but what's amazing is that it's a funny movie. It's a comedy. Michael Moore uses every weapon in the book. Satire, sarcasm, cheap shots, you name it, and he makes a great comic star for his own movie as he plods doggedly along wearing that hunting cap and on his mission to interview the elusive Roger Smith. This movie is so funny, it's merciless, and so merciless, it's funny. It's on my list of the year's 10 best films. Well, it'll be on mine, too. Uh, this is a great American comedy, and uh, made out of a tragic situation, which is all these people losing their jobs. And the film really swings wide in its emotional range from being hysterically funny to also really sad, because the first time, we've, we've had a lot of funny things happening, and you see, you know, him making fun of some quote, hick kind of situations, mm -hmm. and then whammo, we start to look at Flint and being devastated, and he gives us a sort of a tracking shot going down the street, and it looks like it's bombed out, and we yeah. see the real devastation that the layoffs occurred, and so we're constantly being whipsawed between very funny things as this mm -hmm. town tries to recapture its sense of self, and also has been absolutely devastated, and so you've got the evil villain, Roger Smith, the General Motors, but you've also got a lot of side characters who are great American And who characters. are hilarious. I think Michael Moore is almost like a Mark Twain here in the fact that he kind of keeps a poker face and just reports on this stuff. For example, they pay Pat Boone a lot of money to come to Flint, right. Michigan and cheer everybody up. And Pat says, hey, everybody ought to become an Amway distributor. And so yeah. Michael Moore says, okay, I'm going to go to an Amway party. So he goes to an Amway party. And then the lady calls him back later, remember, and she had her wrong color coordinates, so she wants right. to shoot the scene again. So then Michael gets his color coordinates done. And it just, it's like the logic is hilarious as they go from one step to the other into this wonderland of fantasy that is tried, is put on top of the fact that Flint is totally devastated by these plant closings. It's really weird how it's so funny. You said it. It's funny and it's sad and then it's funny again. Yeah, I think that people, when they hear plant closing, General Motors and, and, and some uh, uh, executive, they think, oh, that's got to be boring. Mm -hmm. This is easily one of the most entertaining films of the year. I'll it's tell a you, superior it's film. It's the funniest film I've seen since A Fish Called Wanda. It's really good. Coming up next, Triumph of the Spirit, the true story of a Jewish Greek boxer who survived the Nazi death camps. Willem Dafoe stars. Please tell the Sturmbound fear that I will win for him. He can bet his life on it. Our next film is called Triumph of the Spirit, a well-intentioned dramatization of the true story of a Jewish Greek boxer who used his fighting skill to survive the Nazi death camp at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Willem Dafoe from Platoon and Mississippi Burning plays the boxer, Salamo Arush whose fighting skills are discovered when he battles another prisoner, a Nazi collaborator, while on a work detail. Salamo is soon taken to the office of the Nazi leader of the camp, who intends to bet on him in the regular fights at the camp. The Sturmbannführer says, you must understand the officers bet on these fights. There is much money at stake, and the Sturmbannführer wants to win. Please tell the Sturmbannführer that I will win for him. He can bet his life on it. After he wins his first fight, Slamo is confronted by a gypsy inmate of the camp played by Edward James Olmos, who is sort of a toady 
for the Nazis. Pass it over so I can have my share. I fought for it. It's mine. Connection in this place could help you stay alive. Triumph of the Spirit also features scenes in the women's section of the camp, and it does take us briefly into the crematoriums where millions of people were incinerated. But the problem with the movie is that it is no way as horrifying as the reality of the concentration camps must have been. This is a problem that afflicts so many Holocaust dramas, particularly those on TV. They soft pedal the horror, a horror so immense that it should never be minimized. If you're going to tackle this subject, you have to do a better job than Triumph of the Spirit. It's not so much that it's bad, it's just not good enough to recommend. That's kind of the way I feel about it. The movie has its heart in the right place, but it doesn't really have, among other things that it doesn't have, a dramatic parabola. You want to ask the question, why this movie about this particular character? Like millions of other people, he was incarcerated in this prison camp. Like some people, he survived. He survived because he was able to box, and so they didn't kill him because he entertained them. And then the war was over, and he got to go home. And so, in a, in a sense... How interesting is his story? You're how really... interesting is his story compared to millions of other stories? Why is this movie, why was it compelling to tell this story? And we've seen some movies that, that devastated us, Shoah, for example, about the prison camps. And so when you see this movie, you say, I don't, just don't understand what the reason was why this story had to be told. It is very difficult to match his experience mm -hmm. with the shots that we don't see. And we feel yes. really cheated mm -hmm. when we see the people about to, get, uh, to be gassed and then burned, mm -hmm. but we never see that shot. It's like I want to yell at the director, turn the camera a little bit. Turn the camera and, let you, and show us. It's too difficult to show people being thrown alive into fires or to be gassed. Well, well then, don't make the movie in a maybe, way. Maybe they felt that, that, that they didn't want to go that far, but in that case, <laughs> you're right. In that case, why make the movie? Let's not minimize. Let's not make it palatable. Exactly. Yeah. Coming up next... Mystery train in which three very oddly assorted groups of people turn up in Elvis Presley's hometown of Memphis. I, I better be going. I gotta go. Our next movie is named Mystery Train, and it's the new film by the hot young director Jim Jarmusch, who's Stranger Than Paradise and Down By Law have been both cult and popular hits. His new movie is a mysterious and sort of haunting comedy that takes place during one long day and night and the next morning in Memphis, Tennessee, and centers around three groups of characters. The first couple are rock and roll fans who have come all the way from Japan to visit the Memphis shrines honoring the birthplace of rock and roll. The young man is a Carl Perkins fan, but his girlfriend idolizes Elvis. They're in a flea bag hotel run by screaming Jay Hawkins and Sankey Lee who don't know what to do with the Japanese plum they left as a tip. Well, I don't think you should eat that thing. Yeah, you're probably right. You gonna eat it? No. I ain't gonna eat that thing. Meanwhile, two women who are stranded in Memphis agree to share a room for the night, and they are visited by a famous ghost. Excuse me. Excuse me, ma'am. No, I was in it to hear. Excuse me. Uh, no, really. Excuse me, ma'am. Uh, I must have got the wrong address or something. The movie's next group are Rick Avila, Steve Buscemi, and rock star Joe Strummer, who plays a lowlife nicknamed Elvis. They've been hanging out in a bar and seem headed for trouble. You better straighten up, Johnny. Go for a spin in Earl's caddy. Who's Earl? All three stories center around that Fleabag Hotel where a mysterious pistol shot is heard by everyone while Elvis sings Blue Moon on the radio. In a way, not a whole lot happens in this free train. It's heavier on atmosphere than plot, but that's what I enjoyed, the opportunity to try to figure out these strange and oddly assorted people whose paths crossed at such an unexpected time and place. A lot of movies look like they could have been shot anywhere, but Jim Jarmusch's movie is shot inside the very heart and soul of Memphis and creates a mood that is haunted and nostalgic and sometimes violent and also often very funny. I didn't think it was funny enough. I like the uh, first two films that he made very, very much. Uh, this picture, I like the first third. I like the Japanese couple uh -huh. coming through. And then 
I, I would have followed them actually through the whole story. Mm -hmm. um, the the middle chapter with the two women. I didn't that, think that's was, the weakest. Well, I didn't think it was anything special. And 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 the group at the end, that really I don't know. It seemed so fresh or particular. It seemed like a bunch of, of guys just hanging out, getting into trouble. And that could have actually taken place, I think, just about anywhere. So the first third of the movie I like. The rest. Of it, not I think special. maybe what he was trying to show was that the image of Memphis that is in the uh, minds of these Japanese rock and rollers is so different. I mean, they have a hilarious scene where they go on a tour of the Sun record plant. Very funny. And that woman has memorized her speech and she can deliver it in 15 seconds. Right. But then the other stories are, are more about how, the, about the, the, the mix in Memphis that created rock and roll, the mix of violence and low life and, and energy and vibrancy and strange characters that kind of created what they came there, but they never got to see what they really came to see. Right. Well, I could handle that, and then having them be frustrated uh -huh. continuously would have been kind of interesting. Again, the middle chapter, I don't know if the two girls represent what what you just said, which sounds like it's an interesting subject. Mm -hmm. uh, the guy's true at the end. No, the, the middle part is the weak part. Okay. No. Coming up next, a documentary on legendary jazz pianist Thelonious Monk. It's called Straight No Chaser. <laughs> Our next film is called Thelonious Monk, Straight No Chaser, telling part of the life of the celebrated jazz pianist through documentary footage of him performing, recording, and being interviewed. In this case, the music is much more captivating than the man. Here, Monk at the piano performs his classic song, Round Midnight. to get very close to the man himself, as, for example, in this interview with him, and later, his road manager. I was in the room, Nelly was in the room, backstage, and a reporter came in and asked him what kind of music he liked. And Thelonious, well, I like all kinds of music. A perfect legitimate answer. And then the reporter said, well, do you like country music? Thelonious didn't answer me. And the reporter said, well, uh, did you, well, do you like country music? And Thelonious didn't look at the reporter, looked at me and said, I think the fellow's hard of hearing. The only time the personal story of Monk is made interesting is when the film suggests that he might have suffered some sort of brain damage, and that accounts for sometimes his strange behavior. Thus, Straight No Chaser is an easy film to review. It works when Monk plays, but only when he plays. There doesn't seem to be enough of an effort here made to explain his place in jazz history or render his life worthy of a feature film. Gee, I saw a much different movie than you did. This movie is really about the life of Thelonious Monk in addition to his music. And it's made quite clear that this man had a mental problem that caused him to be closed off from everyone and to continue to close the door more and more through his career. There's that scene in the airport where he turns right. around and around and That's around. That's fascinating. And around. And other scenes where the people who loved him and who tried to support him talk about the fact that even while he was making this wonderful music, he was drifting away into that private place so that finally he spends the last uh, eight or ten years of his life just sitting in a room, but when they play some music, he'd open the door to listen. So it's a human tragedy, Gene. It's about a man who was a great jazz innovator and who was mentally ill to the point where he finally couldn't connect with people anymore. That's When you say it's hard to, to, uh, that the movie doesn't uh, really relate to, to Thelonious Monk, he didn't relate to anyone, and that's what the movie's about. Well, I thought if there would have been more investigation of that, I wanted to see more of that. That's exciting. I would like to know more about it. I'd like to see that. But... And have more people talk about the relationships with him, but um, the, the film doesn't have enough footage there. Oh, I thought it did. I, you know, it talks to people who live with him. It talks to people who loved him, him, people who managed him, people who played with him. It shows him on screen. You can understand that he can hardly communicate with these people. I felt it was a really extraordinary portrait of this man's life. Not good enough for me. Okay. Okay. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed on this show. Two thumbs down for National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation which seems to have the makings for a good comedy, but never delivers. Two jubilant thumbs up for the triumphant comedy Roger and Me. We both think it's an American classic. Two thumbs down, though, for Triumph of the Spirit, a well-intentioned but not compelling story of a Nazi death camp survivor. A split decision on Mystery Train. I liked its mixture of Memphis mood and legend. Gene only liked the first third of the movie. And finally, another disagreement on Thelonious Monk, Straight No Chaser. I thought it was a fascinating portrait of a tortured man's great music. Gene wanted to know more about the man. And so 
obviously the movie that springs out from this show is mm -hmm. Roger and Me. I've seen it twice. Mm -hmm. I've rarely seen a film that seems to have captured the mood of audiences in this country more immediately. This is the movie that people want to see right now. I thought, what a great way to make movies. Yes. Find uh, a little drama and then just follow it, trail it around uh -huh. wherever it leads. It'll lead in a serendipitous fashion that'll be more fascinating than any kind of made-up story that uh -huh. people can uh -huh. do. I want this guy to make more movies and I want him to make a lot of them quickly. You know what, and I'm gonna go way out on a limb here. Here's a guy that held a bingo game every Tuesday night in Flint to finance this movie that he shot himself I think it has a chance of being nominated for one of the best pictures of the year. I swear it does. Whether it gets nominated or not, it is one of the best pictures of the year. Okay, that's it for this week. Next time we'll be back with reviews of more big holiday season films, including The War of the Roses, a romantic black comedy starring Michael Douglas, Kathleen Turner, and Danny DeVito. And also She-Devil, starring the unlikely pairing of Meryl Streep and Roseanne Barr. That's next week. And until then, the balcony is closed. Snowcaps, Raisinets, and Goobers. Three big box office hits starring Nestle Milk Chocolate. Moviegoers give them a definite two thumbs up. Lady Stetson. The fragrance that's as spirited as the woman who wears it. Lady Stetson. The spirit and fire of America. Enjoy this holiday season with a Lifesavers keepsake tin and sweet storybook. Both perfect holiday gifts. Lifesavers candy. Isn't life delicious? This Christmas, give the 1990 edition of Roger Ebert's Movie Home Companion with a special section on black and white movies.